agree. Yeah. And then so. and then and then Marshall, uh, after Sharif acknowledges things, then you can maybe just uh, okay. give your background. I think yeah. that'll work well. Oh, and then it, Sharif can start. Yeah. Now it's exactly two o'clock in Cairo time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning in other parts of the world. Uh, good evening in some other parts of the world. This is a beauty of uh, the globalization. It's our pleasure to welcome you all today for the WFAPS online meeting. We had a series of very successful uh, webinars before inviting stars of pediatric surgery from different subspecialties. And today we have another star in pediatric surgery, Professor Sharif Emil. Uh, Dr. Emil probably does not need introduction. He is uh, well known uh, among pediatric surgeons, especially young ones, for his excellent group of educational books, lectures, uh, and training in pediatric surgery. It will be introduced in more details by uh, David Sigalet. Today, we are honored to have two uh, distinguished chairpersons from the WUFAPS board, David Sigalet, the past president of WUFAPS, and Marshall Schwartz. We are happy to welcome, I can see the list of attendees uh, building up. I know a lot of them, they are friends from different parts of the world. It's so nice to have you among us for today's uh, episode of uh, UFAP's online webinar. And now I hand it over to David Sigalet for introduction of our invited guest. Thank you, Sammy. It is indeed a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the Dr. Emil to uh, the Wolfaps audience. Uh, as you say, he already has a, a large number of people who know him well from his educational works. And it's with some pride, uh, I can say that uh, uh, he and I trained in the same place, uh, we have the same alma mater at, at Montreal McGill. But Sharif was originally from Cairo, grew up with his family in different developing countries in the world. He then immigrated to the United States and uh, did his undergraduate degree at the prestigious University of Michigan in chemical engineering. Then he uh, came to Canada to do his medical education at McGill, uh, did uh, surgical residency uh, in the US and, uh, and uh, at Loma Linda, research at UCLA, and then uh, came back to Montreal to do his uh, uh, pediatric surgery fellowship. He did his first uh, stint of practice in the States again uh, at uh, UC Irvine in California, and then uh, uh, was uh, recruited back to uh, become the chair of surgery in Montreal in 2008. Uh, and he has gone on to develop that tremendously. He'll talk about that a bit. He's now the Saputo chair in uh, surgical education uh, with, a, as you'll hear, a strong interest in clinical research and education. So. Sharif, please uh, tell us more about surgical strategies and complex gastroschisis. So uh, let me give you a little background before uh, Sharif starts his presentation. I had the unique experience of kind of witnessing the transition uh, in the management of abdominal wall defects during my training at Boston Children's Hospital. Many uh, people think that uh, the first uh, use of a silo was done in an infant, but in fact, it was not. Uh, at the time, uh, in the late 60s, um, up until the late 60s, uh, large lymphalocils were treated uh, with uh, scarifying the sac and then taking them to the operating room when they were two to three years of age and closing the large abdominal wall defect. In one instance, in a patient uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, the uh, faculty, the attending, was not able to close the abdomen, but they had already removed the sac. So it was a question of um, uh, necessity uh, results in uh, inter invention. And uh, they decided there was some plastic sheeting that the plastic surgeons used, and they sewed that to the edges of the fascia with the idea that they would literally squeeze things back into the abdominal cavity, and it worked. Uh, and from that initial experience is where stage reduction for abdominal wall defects started. Uh, also in the 60s, the mortality for large lymphalocils and large gastroschisis was very high, as high as 70%. The second uh, advance, which uh, we all know is a major advance in medicine, uh, 
was the development of intravenous calories, TPN. And this was done by a surgery resident at the University of Pennsylvania. The first patient that was given uh, intravenous uh, uh, nutrition was at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And the second hospital that embraced that technique was at Boston Children's Hospital at the time that I was there. Um, and so uh, I have a unique perspective and I wanted to share that with the audience because um, now, and actually shortly after those developments, the mortality went from as high as 90% to as high as 90% survival. Um, and that was uh, literally uh, 50 years ago. That's a long time, but and not, in, not in the history of medicine. And I wanted to share that with you. Thank you so much. So I'd just like to start by thanking uh, Professor uh, Sam Ashahata for its very kind um, invitation and really the Egyptian pediatric surgeons in Alexandria and throughout Egypt who are essentially sponsoring this talk today. Uh, you know, my motto in surgical education is we will all learn together. And they have really taught us amazing uh, lessons, techniques and clinical pearls over the last several decades. So I just want to recognize their contribution to pediatric surgery. And I'm wearing my Egyptian hat, my Egyptian tie, by the way, today as a, as a tribute to that. And uh, I also want to thank David. His picture hangs right outside my office here as uh, one of our uh, graduates. And uh, you might not know that it's five in the morning for him. So um, it really takes a lot of dedication to be up this early. So thank you, David, for the very nice introduction. And uh, thank you to Professor Marshall Schwartz for uh, this uh, really nice anecdote. I, I always tell my trainees that you have to know where you came from if you want to know where you're going. And I think uh, we underestimate the value of really understanding the history of our specialty and how things came about. Um, this year, for the first year, the American Pediatric Surgical Association accepted history abstracts. So that's going to be a very new dimension in how we, um, we look at our specialty. Uh, so thank you again for uh, giving me the chance to speak about something I really uh, enjoy talking about. Just want to make sure the slides are moving. Yes. Great. Yes. So I do some consultation work for Bentec uh, Medical, which makes the silos, and I should disclose that. Uh, most of my compensation is uh, to obtain silos to send them to low-income uh, countries. Uh, I don't have too many objectives. I'd just like us to uh, really try at the end of the hour to maybe come to a, 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 an understanding of a unified uh, or consensus definition of what we're talking about, what is complex gastroschisis, and then to look at some surgical strategies that may improve the outcome of babies who have this anomaly. Now, um, just on a personal note, uh, gastroschisis was really one of the reasons I went into pediatric surgery. Um, I was a medical student starting my rotation in the NICU, and on my very first day, I had a baby uh, with gastroschisis born, very impressive, obviously, and it was quite amazing to me that um, as I finished four weeks later, the baby was almost ready to go home, and I was really quite struck by how such an impressive defect and such an impressive anomaly with all the intestines uh, out can have such an amazing um, outcome. So 30 years would go by and I would get to edit this um, seminars in pediatric surgery. And it's really my journey over the last 30 years that uh, I would like to share a small part of uh, with you this morning. So, uh, you know, when we first started talking about gastroschisis, this was a typical uh, outcome. A baby would have a huge incision like this, and often they would have a gastrostomy. And really over three decades, we've gone from what you see on your left to what you see on your right, a baby who uh, has a sutureless closure and maybe a small uh, umbilical hernia that may or may not need to be repaired. So it's really been a revolution in, in uh, the outcomes of this disease. And of course, um, that has not been global. We're still very much struggling as an international pediatric surgical community with the outcomes of gastroschisis uh, around the world. And it is definitely still the focus of a lot of work. And I, I work with the Hendron Project as well. And I've invited um, surgeons from Egypt and, and from uh, African countries and India and really all over the globe to share their experience because we will only make progress on this if we truly uh, keep learning together and keep learning from each other. So if we think about what really determines the outcome, of a baby with gastroschisis. I think we can 
look at it in three categories. There are some that are patient defined and those are probably the most important in our setting in a sort of high resource settings, so gestational age, birth weight, are there associated anomalies and intestinal complications, what we're going to talk about today that right away changes the outcome immediately. And then there are a few things that are clinician controlled and there's still some controversy, uh, but I think things like timing and mode of delivery have more or less been settled although studies continue to look at refinements of those. Closure methods, again, it's, you know, it's been the focus of a lot of um, webinars and publications, but, but to be honest, closure has never been shown to make a difference to outcome. Uh, of course, nutrition is very important, uh, but really in our setting now, it's infection. So for those who do not have uh, intestinal complications, it's catching a, a line infection, a clapsy, uh, that really makes a difference. So that is an area where we have really intervened. And then again, what are some of the surgical strategies in patients with complex gastroschisis? And that's why this has been an interest of mine because I think it's one of the few remaining areas where what you do surgically can actually make a difference given uh, a healthcare system and, and other um, uh, settings that are favorable. And of course the health systems is really, when you look at it in a global way, that is by far the most important the human resources the material resources, and we've done webinars featuring the work of, again, surgeons from around the world, from South America to Egypt, to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, <clears throat> Asia, and, um, and really the, there's been some ingenious ways of trying to improve the outcomes of these, of these patients. And I would just point to you again, for those of you who are joining us from uh, different places today, uh, to the work of Naomi Wright, who uh, has really championed this area of trying to improve gastroschisis outcomes in low resource settings. So what is our role as surgeons? Well, closure, obviously, but really a big part of our role is to treat intestinal complications. And those complications are typically congenital, like atresia, stenosis, volvulus, necrosis, perforation, or sometimes they can be acquired, like necrotizing enterocolitis or some complications of closure, like necrosis, for example, from a compartment syndrome or problems with the silo. And as, um, as Dr. Schwartz just mentioned, um, you know, 21st century outcomes for gastroschisis are now really quite favorable. They're pretty much between 90 and 100% with many, from many of these different um, North American centers in the UK. Uh, but when we start looking at simple gastroschisis, this is where there's still a real step down of outcomes. Even in the most favorable of settings, there's still a significant mortality associated with that. We did a North American study where we looked at very large databases uh, using the CAPSNET database from, the, from Canada and a kids inpatient database from the US. And this is over a, a decade. And you can see that overall survival in North America is uh, approaching 100%. Um, but really the, what keeps it below that is that the patients with complex gastroschisis still have about a 10% mortality, which is quite significant. And so this is really where, um, if all else is favorable, we still need to be thinking about how we can improve our care. Before I came to McGill, I was in California for a long time and uh, we, had, we had a very, quite a, a busy gastroschisis center, although not as busy as many from um, centers outside uh, Europe and North America. And again, our survival to discharge actually was not different between simple and complex, but there was a hidden mortality for complex gastroschisis. When we followed those patients, up to two years, you could see that survival really dropped from 95% to 82%. Those who did survive did very well. Most of them were on oral feeds. Some still needed gastrostomy feeds and only one patient needed TPN. Now, this was at a time when we didn't have the um, TPN modalities that are uh, uh, liver protective for patients who with short bowel, uh, and that really made the difference. So now this, would, uh, this number would probably not be really accurate anymore. And once again, like many have shown, complex gastroschisis makes a huge difference because you can see not just in mortality, but also in all of the parameters that we look at as surrogates of morbidity, how long you keep them on TPN, how, how long it takes to start feeds, how long you have to ventilate them, what is the hospital stay, it almost triples once there is complex gastroschisis. So it is a major determinant of outcome still. So what is complex gastroschisis? Well, I would say that there are some things that are non-controversial that we as pediatric surgeons all would agree on, and that is intestinal injury at birth, atresia, necrosis, perforation, volvulus, or 
patients born with short bowel. But there are some things that are controversial. And I say they're controversial because we still get a lot of publications uh, titled uh, outcomes of complex gastroschisis. And we see that these surgeons are actually talking about matting, are talking about the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. There was one paper from a very prominent center in North America that classified patients as complex gastroschisis if they had gastroesophageal reflux and needed a fundoplication. And that was surprising because I've never done a fundoplication in 20 years of practice on a gastroschisis baby. And um, if there are associated anomalies outside the bowel. So in order to really be able to work internationally, I think, and compare outcomes and compare interventions, I think the first step is to define what we're talking about. So my uh, proposal is that we should consider congenital uh, lesions, the reason for gastroschisis. In other words, a gastroschisis should be con co complex if at birth it was complicated by congenital atresia, necrosis, perforation, or volvulus. Because the outcomes of patients who develop complications afterwards is very different, and the challenges, what we need to do for those patients are very different. So by that definition, this baby who comes in at five months after having been sent home at five weeks of age feeding and comes back with a severe jejunal stricture should not be considered a baby with complex gastroschisis because this baby will do very well. You know, the rest of the bowel is okay. Do a, a, a resection, primary anastomosis, feeding in a few days and resuming their life. And that's why it's important to differentiate such patients from the definition I just spoke about. Now, as you, many of you know, in Canada, we have a, we're fortunate to have a uh, collaboration called CAPSNET, and that captures all babies with uh, diaphragmatic hernias and gastroschisis at birth. So it's truly a, uh, a national collaboration that's reflective of national outcomes. Um, and it's been very productive. Um, it's published uh, quite a bit uh, using prospectively collected data in many areas of gastroschisis. But one of its major contributions, I would think, is the GPS, the gastroschisis prognostic score. And that was really the brainchild of one of my colleagues, Dr. Puligandla, uh, who really wanted to move away from this binary uh, simple versus complex and give us a more objective way of looking at gastroschisis so that we can actually always be comparing similar patients. So this classification uh, is by the surgeon at birth on examining the bowel, and it's four categories, matting, atresia, perforation, and necrosis, and the patient can have a score uh, from zero to 12, basically. And what he's shown in his first paper is that if the patient is, has a GPS of more or equal to four, that there's a significant risk of increased mortality, as you see here. But if the patient had anything over two, then there was actually significant changes in morbidity. Again, all the things we look at, the length of stay, enteral feedings, et cetera. So it's really a very objective way of looking at this disease, this anomaly, and we continue to promote it. And now, certainly uh, from Canada, at least, you will not see publications on gastroschisis coming out without some mention of the GPS score, because it really allows us to define what we're speaking about. And this is uh, an example of what you will see if you go on the CAPSNET website. So this is actually reproducible. There's been a lot of CAPA studies done to make sure the surgeons uh, grade things the same way. They can go look at pictures if they're not sure and they can grade it according to the matting. Um, I have been interested in the issue of matting because I've always had the impression that it's not similar to having an atresia or a stenosis or a volvia. So a few years after the GPS first came out, we went back and looked at it again and we found that the patients who just had severe matting, this category that um, has a score of four, but no other intestinal injury actually is in a middle risk group, is an intermediate risk group between the ones who have you know, zero or one score and those who have intestinal atresia. So now we think of matting just by itself as it's, we still consider it complex gastroschisis, but it is in a different spectrum. It is a bit milder on the spectrum. And the other interesting thing is we've just done a study with our colleagues in Brazil, who some of them may be uh, on the call today. And we've actually shown that um, it works in any setting. So not just in a high resource setting, but even in a middle income country setting where overall mortality is still quite a bit higher than what we see. Uh, the GPS still uh, has a very strong prediction of uh, who would be high risk and who would need further um, intervention.
So um, we'll just move on now to uh, if we have a, 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 an agreement on what is complex gastroschisis, what are some of the strategies? So the first is when you see a patient like this. So this is one of the more impressive patients I've seen. Actually, the only patient who was not prenatally diagnosed, which is quite unusual now in our setting. And the baby girl presented, as you see here, and it was very difficult to know what are we dealing with. Um, so this baby went to the operating room. And in fact, what we thought might be a massive loop of bowel or, or just necrotic bowel was just a lesser sac cyst, basically a huge amount of ascites within the lesser sac. But the bowel, as you can see, it was very hard to define. There was no obvious necrosis, but uh, we had no idea how much bowel there was or if there was much uh, viable bowel. So uh, this is really, this, this baby and many like her bring the uh, concept of treating by patients. Whenever you do not know what you're dealing with in gastroschisis, uh, the best thing is to wait because often uh, the bowel will actually define itself. You can see here again, um, the amount of matting on the bowel. We knew that there was a colon because we could see something going down into the pelvis and we knew there was a stomach, but whatever is in between, we really had no idea. And so we put this baby in a silo, a large silo, and we closed her at 10 days. And amazingly, uh, two weeks later, she passed her first stool and went on to recover with absolutely no other interventions. This is her at just, uh, just around her first birthday. And this is her just about uh, last year. And this child had never, has never had any other interventions for gastroschisis. So uh, it often pays off to not be too aggressive about dealing with anything that you really do not, um, do not understand when you look and examine the bowel. But really in complex gastroschisis, I would say there are no, no two cases exactly the same. Each case is unique. And therefore we cannot really provide a universal algorithm uh, that would be relevant to all patients. So one of the main problems, of course, we see is atresia. And just as, it, as when we treat atresia that is not associated with gastroschisis, I like to approach it in uh, three phases. And really, uh, this is what we teach our fellows, is anytime you're going in to operate on a patient, your suspicious has an atresia, whether it's associated with gastroschisis or not, you should be asking yourself three questions at the outset. What's going to be my best option to establish bowel continuity? or conditions for early initiation of feedings. Why? Because this has to do with the immediate morbidity, you know, the, uh, the uh, hepatic stasis, the complications of TPN, uh, uh, acquired infections, et cetera. The other question is, what is the best option to preserve bowel length and absorptive capacity? Because that has to do with the long-term morbidity, the possibility of being a short bowel syndrome patient and having to be TPN dependent for the long-term. And finally, what is the best method to address grossly dilated bowel at significant risk of post-operative dysfunction? Because this is what I call the latent morbidity, the patients who may do well, but come back years or sometimes decades later. I just operated two months ago on a 32-year-old man with atresia who really never had issues of dilatation addressed appropriately and was still having obstructive symptoms. So what you do in the first couple of days really does influence a lifetime. And so there's been a, a bit of a, a surgical dogma, I would say, about, you know, if you believe you have to go back and operate on a patient with gastroschisis because either you suspected an atresia or you actually saw an atresia or there was severe bowel matting and you didn't know at the time that you should wait four to six weeks. This dogma has taken hold in surgery and I'm not really sure exactly where that came from because I'll show you some studies early on that actually we're, we're not calling for that. So that's been, again, an interest of mine because I've operated on many patients reasonably early, sometimes at birth, sometimes within the first couple of weeks, and I've never felt that you really need to wait a very long time. So we did a study again uh, from CAPSNET uh, looking at babies who've had intestinal operations uh, less than 21 days versus more than 21 days. And the numbers were not large. We had about 23 patients in each group because you know the number of patients uh, in that group are small by definition. But there was definitely a trend towards improved outcomes um, with earlier operations. And it was very interesting because again, that's where history is really important. We go back you know, 60 years uh, or 40 years and we see what surgeons were saying at the time. And this is from a paper published in 1981 where again, surgeons at the time were calling for not waiting very long. Because our experience concurs with the finding of others that the intestine appears nearly normal 
within two to three weeks of primary closure. And I do agree, matting usually resolves quite quickly. So this paper um, uh, in seminars, and I'll be happy to share it with the group, uh, is really a, a summary of uh, many of the different things that we can do to intervene, starting with prenatal diagnosis, customized closure. Um, if you have uh, necrosis uh, or perforation, you have to deal with it right away. You don't have the luxury of having to park the bowel and come back and wait. Always try to establish continuity of the bowel early. Um, when there is chronically dilated bowel, there is a syndrome associated with gastroschisis and with atresia where the bowel just becomes pseudo obstructed and those patients will benefit from uh, plication of the bowel. And then the patient who has a persistent obstruction and not having to wait, you know, keep, keep pushing it one week after the next until it's been a couple of months and that patient still hasn't had the obstruction addressed, which is a scenario that I've seen many times. So we go to prenatal diagnosis. And as you know, there's a lot of controversy about what, when do we really, when can we actually use a diagnostic feature on the prenatal ultrasound to elicit an early delivery or a, um, an early intervention in a fetus with gastroschisis. So we do know now that intra-abdominal bowel, we always focused on the bowel extra-abdominal that is being subjected to the amniotic fluid and to the injury. But it's interesting because now I think the most um, maternal fetal medicine specialists would agree that intra-abdominal bowel dilatation is actually the most specific sign of complex gastroschisis. It is a specific sign, but it's not a sensitive sign. Most patients with dilatation will still have no obstruction, no atresia, no stenosis. But when a patient is having, is a, a demonstrating complex gastroschisis, almost always there will be a dilated bowel. But really what is more important is not a single finding, but the trajectory of findings on ultrasound and the repetition of the ultrasound. As you know, gastroschisis is usually diagnosed very early, typically on the first ultrasound. So there's plenty of time to follow that mother. Let me just give you an example. Here is a baby. Uh, this is from, again, my previous practice in, in California where the baby had this, what we call sour grapes. It looked like the bowel was all distended and you can see in this view, the ultrasound, uh, the bowel is sort of uh, really kind of stacked on the mesentery. And then as we followed this baby, the bowel disappeared, the bowel distension resolved. There was no longer any loop seen, but there was turbid fluid in the, um, in the amniotic fluid became turbid. So this baby was delivered immediately on this ultrasound finding. And this is what we found. We found a volvulus with an atresia, including the distal ileum into the colon. So baby had to have an ileocolic resection. You can imagine with this anatomy, a few days later, we would have probably lost the entire bowel. But this allowed us, baby did have short bowel for a period of time, but it did allow us to salvage the child. The other interesting thing that I think now we're looking at very closely is this issue of closing gastroschisis. And I know all of us around the world are seeing this more and more, whereas just maybe 10 to 15 years ago, we were all wondering what is that exactly? So uh, in our series from California, this was actually about a third of all the patients uh, who have short bowel, and it was a very significant uh, defect. This defect has a clinical triad. So this is a, sort of the typical patient, although again, it's a spectrum and it can present in many different ways, but it's a narrow defect. So essentially it's a strangulated hernia, uh, there are proximal and distal atresias at the entry and exit points of the bowel into the defect, and the exterior intestines are often compromised, either ischemic or completely necrotic, as you see in this baby. So uh, our colleagues from um, England, um, University College, actually showed that there are some specific things um, you can look at in ultrasound. So again, intra-abdominal bowel dilatation, but often it's coupled with extra abdominal bowel shrinkage or stability. So when you see the intra abdominal bowel dilating, but the extra abdominal bowel not dilating, that should really raise a, um, a, a significant concern about this. And we are now in CAPSNET actually uh, measuring the defect size, whereas in the past it was felt to be uh, quite difficult to do that. I think with more ultrasound technology and better imaging, we are often able to actually measure the defect size in gastroschisis. Now, what was very interesting for me is uh, how I sort of come to learn about the natural history of this, because this is a baby with closing gastroschisis. Uh, 
who happened to go, the mom went into premature labor and the baby was born at 31 weeks. And it was the only baby in our series who did not have complete bowel necrosis or partial bowel necrosis, but it was beginning, the bowel was beginning to get ischemic and obstructed. And you can see a severe stenosis here at the level of the atresia. So there's very little doubt in my mind that if you can identify these patients Yeah. And look at what happens at the defect. You can see that there is really a noose around the bowel. The bowel proximally in the abdomen is dilated and, and there is a transition zone. And you can imagine that in a few weeks, this would have completely closed and this would have become an atresia and this extra abdominal bowel would have probably been significantly compromised. Um, and again, when you have necrotic bowel and, and the rest of the bowel is, is okay, there is no reason in these patients not to do a primary anastomosis. So this is a different baby, also with closing gastroschisis. And you can see again here the atretic points, removed the mass, did a primary anastomosis. We did not want to do anything to a dilated bowel because this baby had short bowel and we wanted to preserve everything. But we did our anastomosis, we came back a few months later, did a step procedure, and were able to get this baby off TPN a few months later. Now, what will happen if you have this situation? Um, this is a patient, uh, one of my partners put the baby in a silo, but was leaving town and told me there's a loop of bowel that I'm concerned about right off the bat, not, not, had nothing to do with the silo. There was a loop that looked um, ischemic, uh, but not frankly necrotic. So he put the baby in the silo and over a couple of days, the loop went on to necrose. So what do you do when you have a necrotic loop and you cannot close the patient? Well, the silo is actually very versatile. And in this patient, for example, we did a resection, primary anastomosis. We put another silo in with the anastomosis in the silo and just reduced it very gently. And that uh, baby did very well. Uh, we use silos now quite liberally, as you all know, um, but we it's, it's what we call a possible error trap. So an error trap is something that works well most of the time or nearly all the time, but when it doesn't, it can have disastrous complication. And this is really the case with silos is that they can compress the mesentery um, if you don't adequately um, dilate the defect sometimes and you can end up with really a disaster. And I've had those myself, so it's very humbling. Um, and there is a YouTube video, if you're interested, you can just put gastroschisis silo on YouTube and we go through all of the fine points, if you will, of, of trying to avoid complications of silo. Here you have a patient who has a volvulus and an atresia. And again, we have a mass here that is, is we do not know if there's anything uh, viable, although it's unlikely. So again, we parked the bowel here in a silo. It went on to completely necrose, removed it, closed the ends. And this is a child where contrast studies will help you to know what you're dealing with. So this patient had a, a very proximal jejunal atresia and then a microcolon, but really nothing in between. And we were able to understand our anatomy, go back and do a jejunal colic anastomosis. This baby was actually doing very, very well and, and then died suddenly after his first birthday. And we never really understood what occurred, but it might have been a hypoglycemic episode, although he was really weaning off from TPN very nicely at the time. So finally, we have a scenario that we all struggle with. And that is um, a patient who seems to have simple gastroschisis, maybe with matting, but nothing obvious, no obvious atresia, and yet the patient is not uh, improving. So when should you explore this patient who has maybe no atresia obvious or a suspected atresia but not proven, who's not tolerating feeds? And you know we often go to contrast studies, but I would say that in many cases, the studies may not be helpful. I mean, if you put contrast in the stomach and a few hours later it's in the colon, that's great. But that's not what typically happens. Typically, it's so slow that it sort of holds up somewhere in the bowel because the motility can also do that. So you can do a contrast study, but I wouldn't necessarily think that it's going to be the sole criteria for acting on that. So really, the way I manage these patients is to, to ask myself, did I suspect an atresia? And if I suspected an atresia because of a transition zone or a grossly dilated loop, then I would explore early, as I mentioned here at two to three weeks. If I do not suspect an atresia, 
for example, a, uh, a sigmoid that was distended and full of meconium uh, and nothing else distended, but the bowel is matted, I will wait about four weeks because motility can really take up to that time. But if you look at statistics, by four weeks, about 90 some percent of all babies with simple gastroschisis should be tolerating some feed, maybe not full feeds, but at least a significant amount of feed. So if the baby is not tolerating any feeds by that age, there's usually a problem that has to be addressed. So just to summarize, and I hope I left enough time for many um, uh, comments and contributions, because again, I think uh, I'm gonna thank Dr. Um, Shahata again, because this is really an amazing opportunity for all of us to learn together. So I'd love to hear your experiences and your pearls. Um, but these are, I think, the main, the salient points that I'd like to leave you with, that um, there is a way to identify uh, uh, select patients that are uh, at risk prenatally. Silos have to be used carefully. Immediate bowel surgery is not contraindicated in the correct situation. Should always aim to establish bowel continuity early and explore patients reasonably early if they have persistent obstruction. I'll finish with an invitation um, that uh, was mentioned. I would love for all of you to continue to join us on CB Clips. And now the idea is to make this really an international program. We've now had surgeons from Lebanon and Brazil um, uh, uh, presenting. So it's not just uh, you know consuming the uh, contents, but actually presenting the contents. And I'm very excited about that. So if you're interested in presenting an episode, I would love to work with you to prepare an episode because again, all of you have so much to teach the rest of us. And finally, Mark Levitt and I have been running a program that's now coming to its very end, but we still have a few copies of our book. So for surgeons in low middle income countries uh, whose institutions have not received copies, please contact us um, through social media and we'll be happy to send you copies. There's only about 25 left. So we're coming to the very end of the program. So thank you so much once again for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks to the surgeons in Egypt once again for everything um, they've done from uh, a clinical and educational point. And I'll be very happy to take questions or just uh, hear your comments. And 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 uh, this is uh, Montreal is getting cold, but uh, it actually gets cold and uh, quite a bit festive. So a Merry Christmas to all of you who will be celebrating Christmas soon and a very happy holiday and a happy new year to everyone else. Wonderful, thanks Sharif. Um, there is one question in the, in the Q and A box. Can you see it? From our colleagues in Cambodia. Sure, good afternoon. I have some questions to ask you for gastroschisis. It is always with malrotation. When do you manage for the malrotation? Uh, enema evacuates always required. How to avoid adhesions of bowel? Do you perform adhesiolysis or not? Okay, that's a great question. No, I, I don't. So actually that's been looked at is what is the value of malrotation and what is the risk of mid gut valvulus in gastroschisis patients who are all malrotated, obviously. Um, the risk of mid gut valvulus is extremely low. What's interesting is um, one of our colleagues in Paris who is a, an, a, an embryologist and a pediatric surgeon really believes that the, this is this explains a lot of what happens in gastroschisis is that it is a uh, like a prenatal volvulus of some degree or another that has caused the injury so that's one of the the theories of why gastroschisis happens and she has a lot of dr Boudouin has a lot of a uh, lot of uh, interesting work on this but uh, you can't do anything about the adhesions because anything you do about the adhesions will just create more adhesions so again unless you have an adhesive bowel obstruction I don't do any last procedures when I close these patients. I don't, uh, I really don't even look at the rotation, to be honest. Um, again, if there has been a problem, it would have already manifested itself as you saw in some of these um, problem, uh, cases I showed you. But if the patient just has bowel matting, I don't address the adhesions or the uh, malrotation in any way. And I don't know if anybody else does, but um, I don't. Wonderful, uh, um, uh, Sharif. And now we have um, a series more questions. So I'll um, get you to direct your attention there. You can just go through those. Uh, yeah, in our setting, we don't have access to commercial silo bags. Really hard to procure. Any advice? Yes. So 
you you really need to uh, contact Naomi Wright, and uh, and you're welcome to contact me if you don't have her um, her her um, uh, contacts, and I will connect you with her because Naomi has come up with very inexpensive silos. You know, silos that that cost uh, well under ten dollars, um, as opposed to the three hundred and some dollar silo that's being sold in North America and Europe. Um, and so there are now silos that are quite uh, inexpensive, and many are using the uh, wound protector. Uh, the wound protector is also quite inexpensive, and that has actually worked quite well as a uh, substitute for the silo as well. So there are now um, quite inexpensive ways to substitute for the silo. Um, only severe matting is considered complex. Yes, only severe matting is considered complex. So uh, zero or one matting, we do not put those in the complex category anymore. Uh, we, had a, we had a patient with vomiting and feed intolerance, dilated bowel on x-ray, found to have some milk protein intolerance, which takes long time to diagnose. Any experience? Well, so cow's milk protein intolerance, of course, can happen with any congenital bowel anomaly or in patients who have no anomalies. The problem is, uh, I, I don't think it should cause a mechanical bowel obstruction. So if you think the patient has a mechanical bowel obstruction, even if they have a cow's milk protein intolerance, uh, I wouldn't be waiting for too long believing that that's really the etiology. So Sharif, there's one question in, uh, in the chat. Uh, have you met any cases of gastroschisis associated with cystic fibrosis? Do you ever test for CF and when should you? I've never seen in 30 years a patient with CF and gastroschisis, but of course, by coincidence, I'm sure there are some patients uh, who have been reported. I doubt it. I, I don't doubt it. Like we, I just had a, a large sacrococcygeal teratoma in a baby who unfortunately ended up having CF. So, you know, there's always this potential um, coincidence, but no, we do not test routinely for CF at all. And another question in the, in the chat. Um, is there any feeding tricks for gastroschisis cases? Uh, that's a question, that's an answer that could probably go on for about three hours. Are there any feeding tricks? Yeah. So what I would say is there have now been a number of publications looking at protocolized feeding. So it's not so much a trick, but it's a having a rational way of, um, of advancing the feeds, because as you know, this is not just variability between centers, but often variability between surgeons and neonatologists, where some are more aggressive than others. So any type of protocolized feeding, and this is our, our, our colleagues from Brazil actually showed this, Dr. Miranda is just mentioning, and uh, he, he just came up on the chat here, um, that any protocolized feeding works better than non-protocolized feeding. I can tell you what Naomi um, Wright's protocols are in Sub-Saharan Africa. You continue feeding the babies even if they vomit. That's the way to override the long need for TPN. And yes, they will vomit, but they will still retain enough calories to get them through the period of ileus. So that's the strategy that's being used there. And amazingly, it actually seems to work reasonably well. Uh, certainly babies who would have never survived are surviving through this. Yeah, that's a huge lesson she's taught us. Sharif, there's a few more questions in the Q&A. It's really uh, popping up there. Uh, if you want to direct your attention back there. Yeah, any comments about gastroschisis with vanished midgut? So if you're talking about vanished midgut, it means the gut has already necrosed. And I think it's just an issue of how much bowel is left because there's no reason not to do an immediate anastomosis and try to feed babies. I usually would put a gastrostomy right away on the first day of life if the bowel is short, so I don't have to come back. But uh, if the bowel is um, questionable, it's best to park it because some of that might actually survive. So if it survives, it may will make the difference between the potential of having no bowel and some bowel, which can obviously change um, the outcome quite a bit. Dr. Miranda from Brazil is uh, saying, we have experience with uh, plastic hemoderivative bags as a silo for stage surgical treatment. Yes, and they have come up with a number of ingenious uh, solutions actually that um, have really been, um, have changed the outcome in their institution quite dramatically. So uh, look at his publications because there's some really interesting things that they're doing in Brazil. In Mexico City, we also favored early surgery in complex gastroschisis. Good, so I'm not the only one preaching that. That's great. Um, 
Okay, we did the cystic fibrosis. In dilated segments, what you advise? This is an excellent question. Resection versus tapering. So that goes back to the three questions I put in the slide. Remember, one of them is uh, establishing bowel continuity. But the second is what do you do about dilated bowel? And that is completely dictated by whether you have short bowel or not. If you have no short bowel, you have the luxury of removing quite a bit of the dilated bowel, okay? And the more distal the atresia, the easier that is, because the more distal the atresia, the less dilation you have in the entire bowel. It tends to be just a segment proximal to the atresia that's dilated. Whereas when you have a jejunal atresia, the amount of dilatation is massive, and you often will have a mega jejunum. So if you do not have short bowel, resect. If you have short bowel, taper. And if you're not sure, just create bowel continuity and come back and examine another day when the baby has had a chance to recover. So it really depends on whether you have short bowel or not. Brief, there, uh, tapering, please go ahead. Yeah, tapering versus plication, what do you prefer? Um, I don't believe, um, uh, you mean like a, a surgical resection tapering versus plication tapering? Uh, yes. Or inverting the bowel in? Yeah, inverting. If you have short bowel and you have dilated, you taper or you apply yeah. it? So certainly when I operate in Africa, I don't resect the bowel because I don't want to take any chance at any sort of uh, uh, leak or anything like that. So I tend to taper, but I have to say it's not my favorite. I, if I can resect, I will. And I do resection tapering using a stapler. That's, that's my, my preferred way of tapering the bowel. So a lot of more questions are coming. We have, uh, Sharif, you have uh, succeeded to stimulate the audience to shooting a lot of questions. So you can see a lot of them. Interesting, actually, questions around here. Uh, if there you have atresia, yes, atresia, and you, you cannot operate either because of prematurity or matting, how, how would you proceed? So um, if you um, cannot operate, but you can give TPN, I would just park the atresia. I would not worry that it's going to perforate while I'm waiting because it's been there already for months. So it's not going to perforate in a couple of more weeks. I would just leave everything alone and let the baby grow on TPN and then come back. If you do not have TPN and you really is either feeding the baby or not, then this is a, this is a situation where you may want to do a stoma because if you do a stoma, you may be able to feed that baby. So again, it really depends on your resources and every solution is obviously linked to the healthcare system we operate on. But the, the goal should be to try to get some nutrition in the baby. If you have TPN, great. If not, then the best thing is to divert the bowel and, and then even on a, you know, on a kilogram baby, you can do a stoma, right? And you can do a stoma and then you can come back and deal with it later. Uh, there's a great question in the chat. The problem of huge gastroschisis and the associated open abdomen, what options um, do you face uh, in these difficult cases? So we're talking here about evisceration of more than the bowel. I guess that's the question is, um, is, is targeting that because I didn't bring that up, but there are some patients who really have massive defects that are uh, more like uh, abdominal wall agenesis uh, with uh, liver protrusion. And uh, interestingly, um, the survival of those patients, no matter where you are, is dismal. So we've had two patients with massive liver herniation, and they seem to have significant liver inj injury early on. So I'm not sure that if that's the that group of patients you're talking about, that there is really a high chance of salvage when you have such a massive defect with evisceration of everything. But if anything would work, it would be to cover the bowel with something as soon as possible. And silos don't work in those patients. They will often cause bowel injury because you have to leave the silo for so long. So in those patients, those are the ones where if you have the resources again, something like alloderm coverage or some prosthetic coverage would be, would be favorable. And if not, just try to cover everything even with a plastic sheet uh, to minimize the chances of massive infection. But those patients with massive defects are really a group on their own. And again, they're not really the typical complex patient by our definition. Sharif, a corollary to that, and it's been a uh, dilemma of mine, is the markedly premature infant, uh, let's say a 26-week infant uh, that has uh, all of their GI tract uh, out, and the abdominal cavity is almost non-existent. 
And the dilemma is, how are you ever going to get this back in? Uh, our experience has been, even if you try, uh, and obviously these babies are on a ventilator, and as soon as you increase their intra-abdominal pressure very much, um, uh, it's a battle between ventilating them and getting their GI tract in. Yeah. So um, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's part, it's, it depends where the patient is, I think, on the spectrum, because you're right. Uh, every now and then there's a very severely premature patient who you're really stuck with. And the silos come as small as three centimeters, but even that can be very, it can be very difficult in a small baby with no abdomen. What we found interesting, though, is that babies who come out at 31 or 32 weeks were still quite small because all gastroschisis babies are small for gestational age. I mean, it's rare to have a baby who actually is appropriate for gestational age. Yep. What we found interesting is that the babies with uh, sort of what I would call mild prematurity, 31, 32 weeks, the bowel also does not tend to be matted. Uh, it, it really, is, so we've done bedside reductions on babies as small as 31, 32 weeks and just use the umbilical flap um, with actually very good results. So it, it just depends again on the spectrum of prematurity and what you have to work with. So I'm talking about 26 weeks. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult I, scenario. Impossible for us. Yeah, I, I think the only possibility if there's going to be a chance is to enlarge the defect and try to get the smallest silo in. But the problem is it will be there for a very long time. And I think that's a patient that again, with all we have right now, unfortunately, the, the, the chance of salvage are very low. Correct, that's been our experience. Sharif, there's some more questions in the QA box. The next one is from Dr. Ashur. And it's, he's asking a bit about that, uh, the, what you're talking about, the sutureless closure. So he asked to kind of uh, share your experience with sutureless yeah. closure. Yeah, so that's, that's really the next thing in gastroschisis closure, or not the next thing anymore, it's here. Um, it's been a bit controversial because, you know, you know how pendulums are swinging, right? We swung towards the silo, we're swinging away from the silo, and maybe towards earlier closure and so on. So um, sutureless closure... Um, I am a fan of it, but I'm not a fan of it <laughs> because I think if you can do it, um, it's great. You really do save a general anesthetic for that patient and you have a great outcome. The problem is, again, it's associated with a lot of divergence in care. So some patients um, are routinely intubated and sedated and given a single dose of paralysis to do suture disclosure. Some are not, and this is where the problems start, where you try to reduce a baby at the bedside without much sedation, and then you have a problem. And again, if you're in a setting where you don't have access to that, then that's the best you can do. I mean, I've done those again in Sub-Saharan Africa more than once, but if you do, then I would prefer to sedate and really optimize. If you have an optimized baby who's relaxed and sedated, then I'm, I am all for it because it really does save on resources and it saves the baby a general anesthetic and uh, the outcomes in terms of uh, final appearance or so on are excellent, like the picture I showed you here. So what we do now is we are actually formulating a protocol for suture disclosure, and that would be our, um, uh, you know, our default approach to try to close every baby with simple gastroschisis as a suture disclosure at birth under sedation and a dose of paralysis. When we do not succeed, we put a silo and we do a delayed sutureless closure. And even if the umbilicus has completely necrosed and you were not able to keep the umbilical stump, you can still pull the abdominal wall together once everything is reduced and just use a whole lot of steri strips or whatever adhesive you like to use. And we've had actually quite good results. So if you look at the CAPSNET um, uh, experience, David, I think sutureless closure in Canada now is being used on about two thirds of patients. So it has really risen significantly since it was first described. Great. The next question, I don't know if you can see it uh, on your screen, Sharif, is from Abir Abuzalam, who's asking about the type of crystalloids for resuscitation, normal saline versus Ringer's lactate, and I, whether you've encountered hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis. Yeah, my, my colleague Pramod has been really interested in the issue of uh, electrolytes and uh, resuscitation. Here is the one thing that has changed, and I'm glad this question brought up. I don't know, to be honest, if there's any uh, advantage or difference between saline and, uh, and ringers. But again, we were all taught in our training that these babies need massive amounts of fluid because they have exposed bowel and they need to be resuscitated aggressively. And 
and that's not the case. I mean, again, that, that, that has actually been looked at very carefully through CAPSNET and other uh, databases that these babies do not need massive amounts of fluid. They might need maintenance or one and a half maintenance, and the massive amounts of fluid may just swell their bowel even more. So you really should not go with any predetermined uh, static. You shouldn't go say, okay, I'm going to just give this baby three times maintenance right away. Look at the baby's hemodynamics, look at the baby's urine output, and use uh, intravenous fluids prudently. Whether you use normal saline or lactated ringers, I, I don't really have experience in that, but I, we don't typically I would, use I would, I would I would to jump in here as well. The, the one thing is normal saline, if you look at it, the pH of normal saline is 5.2. So they will all, if you do have a significant need for a resuscitation, they will all get hyperkaremic metabolic acidosis. So that's the benefit of Ringers is that it's, uh, it has um, a pH balance, so it's 7.2. But the trouble is that many places don't have D5 Ringers lactate, which is what we want to use. So, so if you have a choice between using uh, D5 normal saline and lactated Ringers, we have our local experience where we say use the lactated ringers in the initial resuscitation. And then when the baby's stable and you know where you're at, as you say in the paradigm, then you can switch over to the, the dextrose containing solution. There's also potassium in the ringers lactate and not in the normal saline. Mm. So that's why I prefer ringers lactate for that additional reason as well. Because otherwise you're gonna make them hypokalemic. Yeah, for sure. Yes. There's a question um, from Arwa about TPN and silo. Uh, and, and I think you've already talked about it, but you may want to comment specifically. Yeah, so again, um, Naomi has come up with TPN substitutes, if you will, uh, that are really quite inexpensive. They may not provide everything. They may not have even intralipids in them, but uh, they are a way of temporizing uh, babies over. Um, so that's the problem is if you have a very... Uh, you know, a very uh, favorable gastroschisis in a setting like this, you can try to silo the baby, close the baby, and you can just feed early and they tolerate as much as they can. And many of those babies will actually get through. But if you need to uh, supplement it, then um, this bundle that she's created, I believe is the best promise we have so far in the lowest of resource settings. So again, I'd be more than happy to share her work with you. If you read Dara's question, I think the question is whether to consider an operation in a child where you don't have the oper uh, option of TPN. Well, I think yeah. you've answered oh, that is to operate, that you, I see. If, if I the see. bowel seems reasonable, operate. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. The, the problem is, I, I, I don't know. To be honest, I don't have that experience of whether you can do a stoma and feed the baby earlier, but I would be uh, cynical about that a bit because if the baby has severe bowel matting and they're not going to tolerate any feeds, I'm not sure that doing a distal stoma is going to really solve that. I don't know. I, and that's a, a great question. I'm not sure anybody's actually looked at it. Uh, but I think uh, I, I would just be a little hesitant to assume that that will work. Um, it's just to decompress the bowel because it's not, it's not a distal obstruction in many of these patients. It's just the entire bowel is matted and, and there's a global ileus. So whether you can treat a global ileus by decompressing it distally, I think it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's fascinating. And maybe we should talk about that some more because I think that's something worth looking into. Uh, Sharif, there's a <clears throat> question in the chat. Strategies to close the abdomen after uh, removal of the silo and you still have uh, abdominal visceral disproportion. Um, and I would make a comment here. When we were using the technique that was described by Schuster where you sewed uh, a plastic, uh, Dacron embedded plastic uh, actually silicone uh, to either side, you could pull pull the fascia together till they actually touched. Whereas with the preformed silo, you still have a ring. And I think that is kind of part and parcel of this particular question. Yeah, I think it's sometimes like, I that mean, ring, it's hard to get the rest of it closed. Absolutely, uh, that, that's a great point. That's actually one of the points we make in the video is that when you use a silo, keep it for as few days as possible because I completely agree the silo will actually dilate the ring uh, and it will actually make the, the, the defect larger. But I think in a scenario like this, if you still need to close, you could look at a multiple things. Obviously, if you have um, some prosthetics, you could try to use that like a Gore-Tex patch. Uh, 
if you are able to just close the skin and accept the hernia, I mean, every baby is a bit different. I would not uh, go into a major uh, compartment separation procedure in a baby. I think that has a significant risk of necrosing the abdominal wall, and then you've lost everything. So that's one thing I would warn against in a small baby. But, uh, but then you really have to deal with what, uh, what uh, the, the situation calls for. Um, there was a question here. Uh, sorry, abdomen. Yeah. Um, no, second. I saw a very interesting question. Yeah. Ilya Latrija. Yeah, there's a question about what to do when there is an, um, uh, a, uh, an obstruction close to the ileocecal valve and whether you would do a Centuli or a Bishop Coop. So, again, this is completely my uh, bias, but I, I don't like these um, anastomosis much, the Bishop Coop and the Centulis, because I think. Most of the time, you can do a, an end-to-end -end anastomosis if you're able to taper the bowel and cheetle the bowel and so on. And I just find that, yes, some of them work very well, but some of them don't. And in, if you don't have short bowel, then I don't worry about sacrificing the ileocecal valve. I mean, yes, there may, may set the baby back a little bit, but if you don't have short bowel to start with, then I really don't believe that you should anastomose to the ileum right of the ileocecal valve. It's better to sacrifice the ileocecal valve and do a good uh, ileocolic anastomosis. It's a different story if you have short bowel. Again, so everybody's different. So I'm more than happy to continue taking questions, but we are at eight o'clock. So I'll leave it up to Professor Shahata to decide if he wants to keep it going. Um, it's, it's your call, Sama. Well, uh, Sharif, as I just mentioned, you, you succeeded to stimulate the audience. And actually the discussion part is as good as a talk. It's very it's interesting. Better. It's much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we have a great audience with experience here. They are shooting a lot of interesting questions and we have two excellent chairpersons. So if you all agree and you don't have obligations, Sharif, you can continue for more uh, uh, five, seven minutes to answer yeah. a couple of questions or discussion because everyone seems to be enjoying it. Yeah, I'm more than happy to stay. You just tell me when you want to kick me out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll tell you, don't worry, I'm my friend. So one question was about using the blood bag, uh, blood derivative bag as an alternative to the silo. Would you agree on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, there's no magic to the silo. I mean, I, I was with Dr. Jim Fisher when he used the first silos, the first Bentec silos back in 19, that's where I did my residency. And that's where he popularized them. And, you know, he just chose that silo. It, it's interesting because it had been made, but it, it was looking for an indication, you know? And he just started using these silos because he found them so much easier than having to suture and, you know, touch the abdominal wall. And then he published 10 patients and, and then it went wild. You know, it really took off after that. It was 1995, so it's been 25 years now. Um, but there's nothing magic about it. I mean, the idea is to try to minimize intervention so that you don't have as much suturing. Every suturing you do to the abdominal wall in a baby can potentially cause more injury. So whether you have a cheaper uh, type of silo, you're able to get the typical silos, you put a wound protector, what, whatever you're able, uh, the solutions that Dr. Miranda has created in Brazil, I mean, they all work fine. The, the whole thing, it shares the principle that once you put something, you still need to monitor the bowel. So when I go to the NICU and I found the baby in a silo and the nurse thinks, oh, it's too, it's too gruesome. And she wraps it all in gauze, you know, because she doesn't want the parents to see it. I'm like, no, that's really not. We need to be looking at the bowel all the time so that if we start to see something go wrong, we don't wait until 12 hours later when there's a gangrenous loop. So these are some of the principles that we talk about in the video, but what you use, I don't think is really makes a, a big difference. And I, I think Sharif, one of the things that, that, that I have personal experience is this issue about supply chain problems, you know, where people have had access to Bentex silos and all of a sudden you don't, and you know you need it. And I think the idea of using a, a blood bag for that, uh, uh, sterilize it, uh, then you can use it is a really good one that we may have to use in other places now. And certainly it's, it's both cheap and more readily available than the preformed ones. The difference is it doesn't have the spring, so you have to suture on the edge, but it, it does all the principal things very well. Agreed. Uh, so there's another question here in the, in the QA box uh, from Dr. Comey. He says, asking any uh, abdominal compartment syndrome in small to moderate gastroschisis in your experience? <laughs> 
it's always possible to have compartment syndrome. I mean, we don't have really good predictors of which baby will go and have a compartment syndrome. And that's the whole point, I think, why, why surgeons swung to the silo in a relatively short time, because patients sometimes who were thought to have a very favorable outcome would be closed and then they would develop compartment syndrome. You know, that's the, that's the rationale. So yes, it's possible. And that's why I think the, even if it looks very favorable, you have to watch very, very carefully because even then the bowel can potentially swell and continue to distend and cause compartment syndrome. So while you, it's more predictive in a patient who's going to be closed tight with you know high airway pressures or very tight and tense abdomen, it can happen in any patient. So I think it's a, a universal hazard. I think one of the things to do you mentioned already is about the over, over resuscitation. I think we in the past did often over resuscitate and in our personal ex our experience, in my personal view, is that one of the most important parameters in these babies is the urine output. If you have good urine output, then you have good perf you know, perfusion and everything's okay. If you don't have good urine output, then you need to be very carefully watching it. And often, and that's that all we can all do. It doesn't require any special uh, uh, technology to monitor the urine output. And um, a very low threshold for reopening the abdomen. Yeah, a absolutely. very, very low threshold. The worst you can be is be wrong, yeah. And, but you've still saved the bowel, whereas if and you're right, fixated, fixated on the closure aspect. It's not about exactly. closing. It's about exactly. So the next question is from Dr. Diarrhea, Di Diary, uh, is and asking, do you uh, allow for term delivery or premature elective cesarean section at 36 weeks gestation? So there is a randomized. Question. Uh, that's a great question. We do not. We were not proponents of either early delivery unless there is specific ultrasound indications, like some patients I showed you in the talk, or a C-section delivery. We do not do either of these. We allow the mother to go into spontaneous labor. And if she has a C-section, it's because of obstetric indications, not because of the gastroschisis. There is a randomized control trial actually going on, delivering patients at 36 weeks versus allowing them to go into labor spontaneously after 36 weeks. So it's not completely resolved the issue, but I would say that the, that the majority of the evidence that exists, and yes, I'll admit that it's mostly from databases and retrospective studies. So this randomized trial, I think will be good, but the, the weight of the evidence, I would say would be against C-section. It's very interesting. And maybe Dr. Schwartz has a, a perspective. When we did our study, uh, looking at the US and Canada, the C-section rate for gastroschisis in the US was twice that of Canada. So in Canada, about a third of the mothers were being delivered by C-section. In the U.S., it was two-thirds. And that was really a glaring difference between the practice in both countries. Yeah, it, that's, it's a great point, Sharif, and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought it up because it was the obstetricians that were doing uh, pushing the C-section uh, really before we even had access to, to these, uh, the mother or uh, obviously uh, the fetus. Uh, and as pediatric surgeons, we vigorously objected to that. The obstetricians were doing it because they thought there was some medical legal issue that could happen if they delayed it. And uh, there was really no evidence for that other than the things that we do look for uh, on, on fetal ultrasounds. But they were just doing it because the baby was 36 weeks. Uh, and uh, we finally have stopped that to a great extent. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to declare that we come to the end of this session. It has been a great session. Still, questions are coming on. I'm sure that uh, Sharif can answer this on the Facebook or on his email. Uh, the good news is this session is recorded and it will be available on our website and on uh, our library uh, YouTube channel, among all other previous uh, talks. Uh, Sharif, this has been another pearl on our string of uh, lectures by experts from different parts of the world. Thank you so much for this uh, outstanding lecture that stimulated our great audience for a lot of coming up with a lot of questions. Uh, David, you have, have been waking up uh, too early in the morning. Thank you so much for being so much dedicated and the great chairperson. Marshall, thank you so much for putting your uh, inputs and your experience and anecdotes. Our great audience from different parts of the world, thank you so much. Uh, 
uh, I would like to invite you to uh, visit our website on the, uh, the web and you can watch all our previous episodes. You will be tuned to our next upcoming ones. And thank you so much all for having such a wonderful online uh, webinar for the WUFAPS. Thank you so thanks much. So and much and great... Thank thanks you. again for the invitation and have a great meeting in Cairo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, David. Bye, Marshall. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.